obviously today we're, we're, we'll be talking all things salaries. So I'd love to hear from you. What comes to your mind when you first, you know, hear the word or think of the word salaries? Oh, Mesa Ridge. Okay. Uh, that's my high school. I feel so proud now. <laughs> Alumni. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. I love it. Wow. First That's thing awesome. that comes to mind when you think of salary. Yeah. Paying bills. There's a lot. <laughs> Paying bills, yeah. I know, oh, you know what comes to mind for me is like, I don't know why the word value comes to me. And it's yeah. not like value in like who you are, because I'm very like, we got to separate those things. But okay. like, what do you value? And like, what value does your work bring, right? And then also like, what value does kind of the, um, the market demands also, right? You know? Um, all right. So people are trickling in. I think, you know, we can kind of jump in if, if you all are good to go. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, today we are, we're giving a sneak peek of our annual salary guide. You know, for years, Aquint has been producing this guide to help both job seekers, right, the talent out there, and also business leaders who are looking to hire. And our guide, it really consists of a, a comprehensive list of salaries from over 21,000 marketing, creative, like design professionals, and close to, I, I want to say, 100 distinct job titles across the U.S., and Canada. So um, I'm, by the way, I'm Den Mondahar. I'm Director of Enterprise and Talent Solutions here at Aquin. And joining me today are two very special guests and experts in their field to help me break down all things salary. So I'd like to give them a chance to introduce themselves and also please share the first thing that comes uh, to mind when, when you think of salaries. Uh, Ro, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you um, today. Um, I am Ro Pilla. I am president of um, Aquin Talent. I've been in the staffing industry for coming up on 17 years now. So salary um, conversations have been a big part of what I've been doing for the last um, 17 years. So what comes to mind when I think of salary? Um, I'm a visual person, so I, you know, I think in pictures. And um, what comes to mind for me is just money, is like pictures of money and then the word opportunity. Um, I think that there is a lot of different um, opportunities to um, earn money, negotiate salaries, just a lot of different things when you, you know, that it doesn't just stop um, you know, just at salary. There's a lot of different ways that you can take it. Now, yeah. uh, well, with, when you picture money, is it like big stacks of like exactly. ones? Like, big stacks, yes. Lots of money, big stacks of money, yes. Okay, all right. I think that's like manifestation in there too, so right? Yes. <laughs> Love it. Visualizing it. Love it, love Bro, it. you and I think alike. I'm thinking like big money bags, not just yes. a dollar. Um, but yeah, I'll introduce myself. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. It's the second year that I'm joining Aquin Talent to talk about this topic. So I guess we've been close ever since and really well aligned. And I just love talking about transparency and money and ways that we can make more. So I'm really excited to be here. Uh, if you don't know who I am, I'm Hannah Williams. I'm the founder and CEO of Salary Transparency, which is a kind of crazy channel that I started on social media, asking people what they do for a living and how much they make ultimately to help close pay gaps and make sure that everybody is getting paid what they're worth. I started the page after finding out I was underpaid in my prior career. So helping people earn what they deserve and what they're worth is really a top priority and mission of mine. So I'm excited to talk about it. Um, and then to answer the icebreaker, what do I think when I think of money? Value is a really good one. Opportunity is a really good one. And I guess I'll add to that on growth. Um, when I think about money, I just think, how can I double it? How can I triple it? How can I flip it? I think money is really fun. And when you look at it from that lens of opportunity and what you can do with it, I think the the opportunities are endless. <laughs> so it's a, it's a fun way to look at it. I love that. I love that about growth. We just had a um, internal ERG meeting where we talked all about like financial health and that was like a big like topic. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm glad that you touched on that. And it's so interesting, like, what does conjure up for everyone like when we think of the word um salaries and i'm just curious i want to look real quick just in the um oh i uh, just in the comments here total compensation um love that equality 
we are going to definitely dig into that for sure. Your worth. It feels like uh, it never feels like enough. I, I know that. <laughs> I, know, like, I know that feeling. Um, awesome. Awesome. Quality of life. Thanks. Um, all right. So, well, let's um, let's kind of get into it here. You know, first, if you are um, a business leader, like a hiring manager, or if you're a job seeker, today is for you both, right? Um, you'll get a peek really at both sides of hiring trends, the hiring process to understand what's really going on in the market today. And um, definitely we encourage you to stay until the end to get a link to actually download our salary guide. Uh, but speaking of the market, let's let's get right into it, right? Uh, we, you know, why don't we start by maybe talking about some of the latest trends that we've seen kind of going into 2024. Um, you know, Hannah, you're you're definitely on the front lines and I'm sure plenty of people have seen uh, some of your, your content, but you're interviewing everyday folks, right? I'm curious, like what have been some of the trends that you've seen um, just in, in, in those day-to-day -day interactions? Yeah, it's really exciting because when I started the page in early 2022, there was still the taboo-ness of asking people how much they make. And I would say my success rate was about one in 10 people would say yes that I would ask. And now it's a lot higher. It's like at least 50%, like five of every 10 people I ask. And the biggest change that I see there is the re reduced, uh, it, what's the word? People don't believe this taboo anymore. It doesn't make sense. And really, we're not just like talking the talk, we're walking the walk. We're not just saying it doesn't make sense. We're saying it doesn't make sense. And also, this is how much I make. And I'm going to tell everybody I know, because I know that secrecy isn't helping anyone, let alone my friends, my family, or my colleagues. So there's just like this stronger willingness to want to share people will sometimes run me down on the street and be like i've been waiting for this moment Can you please <laughs> interview me? And i'm like okay you make my job so easy like of course i'll right. interview you so that's really exciting like workers see the value and they're walking the walk that's, that's progress awesome. that's yeah, yeah. hopefully too because i remember last year we talked about like you having really good quality shoes because you're doing a lot of walking to find these folks. So hopefully you still have yeah. the good quality shoes, but maybe you don't have to walk as much <laughs> and they're, they're coming like to you. Five miles, not 10. Yeah. I got some good yeah, shoes. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll take that. You mentioned something. I remember um, when we were meeting prior to this live, right. About um, something really interesting about like UX roles specifically. And um, I think you, you were talking about like teachers. Can you, can you uh, shed a little bit of light yeah. on that? That's another thing is a lot of workers wanting to transition into different careers and especially careers that are not easy by any means, but you don't have to go back to school and get a four year degree to learn the skills to do it. You can learn transferable skills, you know, through boot camps, courses, easy to use, you know, courses on the Internet and certifications. I see workers are really looking for those opportunities. The whole idea like no one wants to work anymore. That's not true. People love to work and they want to work where they like to work. They don't want to work somewhere where they're not well compensated and not respected. So they're looking for those opportunities out of their current situations if they're unhappy where they are, which sadly, I'm seeing a lot of traction with teachers. Like teachers mm -hmm. are traditionally the lowest paid people that I yeah. interview and they also have the lowest job satisfaction. They're not very happy in their roles, which I hope changes in the future because that is a very dark road to go down if that trend continues. But ultimately we need to pay our bills and feed our families. And so there's no guilt or shame in doing what's best for you. Yeah, and you, you touched on something about um... Uh, you know, teachers kind of doing that transition into like tech fields, right? How has that kind of impacted, um, you know, where where they're at, like salary wise, or like what what have you seen there? Yeah, I mean, they're going sky high in salaries. <laughs> tech traditionally has higher salaries, but I mean, a lot of teachers are making less than fifty or sixty thousand dollars a mm. year with a master's degree um, and wow. several years of experience, if not decades. 
it makes no sense that they are making pennies and not able to, you know, pay their bills. They're living paycheck to paycheck, if not worse. And also, like, it's difficult to support yourself on that salary alone. So a lot of times you see teachers relying on their spouses to make ends meet. And that can cause issues as well. I think people ultimately want independent individual job satisfaction and financial satisfaction and not to rely on others for that. So that's where tech really presents those opportunities. And what's so cool is that tech is not just like coding and like these really hard technical skills. Teachers yeah. that were, you know, teaching elementary students are now going into instructional design or UX. Like there's so many transferable skills there that lend themselves in different industries. And once you figure out what those are, they can really strengthen your resume and help you get in. Love that. I love that. And Ro, I'm sure we, we touch on that all the time in working with talent. Anything you want to like add there as far as like um, trends or kind of transitioning? Yeah, I mean, all the time. I mean, what we see definitely confirms the same thing that Hannah is seeing too. I mean, when the talent market is tight, demand in specific sectors declines or earning potential in other sectors is greater. We tend to see talent shifting into um, different career paths where they can utilize transferable skills. And I think this is a trend that we're going to continue to see this year too. Um, it's actually funny. In our industry, it's something that we see um, as well. Many of the recruiters at Aquin have been practitioners in um, the field before and have transitioned into being recruiters in the field too. So it's something that we see here and to you know, confirm what Hannah was saying too. Um, we've seen teachers become instructional designers, technical writers. Um, we've seen academia researchers become UX researchers. So again, I think this is something that we'll continue to see this year as well. I love that. Yeah, it's and it's, you know, you can always pivot in your career, right? And I think the more that you learn, the more that you, um, you know, upskill, right? It just continues to add to the value that you bring to any role, really, in general. Uh, Ro, I'm curious, uh, so outside of, uh, you know, kind of those career pivots and things like that, any other trends that you're seeing as far as like hiring trends or salary trends that you, you kind of noticed recently? Yeah. So some other trends that we're seeing um, from companies is shifting investment of resources to support new and emerging technologies and products. Um, so, you know, for example, it's no secret. Every company is looking at the way generative AI can be integrated into their workflows, right? Like AI is the word of the year, um, maybe even the, the word of the decade. We don't know yet. Um, but you might be seeing downsizing happening in one area of a company where expected growth and innovation um, is low, but hiring happening in areas where growth is expected and is being invested in. Um, you know, so I think that that's a trend that we're going to continue to see. Um, and the other trend we're seeing is stretching resources. Um, mm. This is one that um, is it's hard on um, it's hard on the employees. It's hard on the job seekers too to really to adapt to the changing world of the of stretching resources. But there's no better time than now to have strengths and multiple skills as companies are looking to hire talent who can wear multiple hats. So I think that that also ties into how important upskilling is um, mm -hmm. in today's market as well. Well, on that note, right? So what we saw in our salary guide is that, like you said, AI is a huge emerging trend. Right. Um, and actually, for the folks in the audience, um, feel free to comment. Like, are you using AI in your work? Has your company adopted it? You know, I'm, I'm really curious to know uh, what everyone's experience is with that. And actually, just as a sneak peek, too. So, uh, to give you all, because we're here for salary. So, I'm just going to, again, sneak peek <laughs> some of these things. Um, one of the emerging roles that we found was an AI content moderator. And I'm sure everyone has seen like a a deep fake or, um, you know, we, we just recently saw some news about voiceover robocalls that were used, right? Um, so an AI content moderator, what we found was as an emerging role, the app, like the mid range for that is the average salary of about $62,000 a year. So this is a, like a brand new role. I don't, I don't know about you all, but I didn't hear about an AI content moderator 
five years ago, <laughs> right? Um, and now for the more like technical, technical, technical roles, like a machine learning engineer, we found like the mid salary was about 255,000 for some of those more technical roles, right? Um, what are your thoughts though? You know, we hear these kind of like really hyped up words. What do you, you know, we were talking about um, career transitioning. Um, how do folks kind of get into this and how do they, like, what are some advice? I don't know if Hannah, if you want to um, kind of uh, tackle that first, but like, what are some advice that you give for folks to, you know, really lean into where, where these salaries are, are going? Yeah, I would say start using these tools. Um, the only way to gain experience with it is to start using it. Um, I, I think sometimes people hear AI and they see these new roles and they think, oh gosh, I don't have the degree for this. I don't have the training for this. Nobody does. As we mentioned, this is a brand new role. This is something that's brand new to this century. It's something that no one has gone to college for because a degree for this does not yet exist. Mm -hmm. So really the power to learn it and leverage it is in your hands. I've already started adopting AI in different ways to help me answer emails, to help me generate scripts. It's not something that I think all of us should be worried about replacing us. We need to figure out how to use it to our strengths and make us more productive and strengthen our current skills. If we can do that and demonstrate that, then it's a great tool to use. And if you're interested in using AI and going into one of these roles, I would start looking at these job descriptions and figuring out how you can start doing the, the description of the job on your own. If you can already start using AI in the same way, write a cover letter, create a portfolio demonstrating that and apply. You don't have to have the directly relevant experience or educational background. You just have to show that you're willing to use it and willing to learn. I think that's huge. I, I, I heard a quote um, recently that it's like, AI will not replace your job. It's the person who knows how to use AI that will replace your job. Absolutely. Right? So I think you yeah. bring up such a great point there, Hannah. And um, Ro, on your side, like what, what are you seeing from business leaders and hiring managers wh when it comes to like that demand or, um, you know, I'm curious what you see there. Yeah. So anything with new and emerging, we're going to continue to see the demand for that skill set increase exponentially. Right. Um, but what we don't see is the talent pool increasing, mm -hmm. you know, the talent pool with those skills increasing at the same rate. So what's really important for companies and business leaders to think about is cre creating those career pathways for either current employees or having a really clear um, pathway for new hires as well to acquire and ramp up those new skills too. The other thing too that I would, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say great point because I find like, in, uh, you know, sometimes as we work with businesses, right, and um, you see how employees tend to get siloed and they're, they're stuck there, right? And there's yeah. not a lot of a leeway for them to go explore other things. So yes. I think to your point, Ro, if you're a business leader, if you're a hiring manager, like how can you tap people who are willing, right, to learn yes. like Hannah and what you were sharing and how they can upskill even within their position to influence right? Influence the organization um, in different yes. ways that we may, might have originally come into. Exactly. And, you know, if you have somebody within your organization that has the right aptitude and attitude to get those, you know, to develop those skills, it's also giving them an opportunity to increase their earning potential too, which I think is a fantastic thing that an employer can offer an employee. Love that. Love it. And you you said something, that, uh, Ro, that reminded me uh, of our um, uh, meeting prior to this, right? You were talking about talent pools. And one of the things that really intrigued me is um, you mentioned how clients were really wondering, where are the talent pools? Can you touch on that a little bit about some of the trends there that you're you're seeing with um, with business leaders and hiring managers? Yeah. So where are the talent pools? So it's interesting. So what happened during um, COVID is a lot of folks, like a lot of, you know, talent moved out of major metro areas to lower cost of living cities. And mm -hmm. so the talent pools, you know, from a ge geographical standpoint really kind of shifted. So, you know, as companies are developing their plans for hiring, 
different types of skill sets. I would definitely encourage them to, you know, especially if they had historically looked at major metro areas for certain types of skill sets, to start um, to expand that search. You know, maybe three, four, five years ago when we were looking for really specific, um, you know, types of talent with different types of um, technology backgrounds. It would be an automatic, we are going to find this talent in Silicon Valley. That's where they live. That's mm -hmm. not so much the case anymore. Um, again, what we saw with the um, with the impact of COVID is that a lot of people um, took that opportunity when we were all working remotely to move out of higher cost of living cities to more um, reasonably priced cities as well. So the talent aren't where um, they traditionally have been. So expanding your search um, outside of major metro areas will be an important strategy. Yeah. And I'll share too. Here's another sneak peek in our salary guide. You know? So especially this is good for um, those hiring. So uh, we saw, for example, a lot of respondents in who are art directors, graphic designers, and even um, marketing managers in what we call city group two, which is uh, cities like Austin, where I'm at, Baltimore, Charlotte, right? So again, kind of getting out of those maybe Silicon Valley type, um, you know, bigger cities into some of those uh, smaller, I mean, Austin's not too small, but it's not, it's no New York, right? So, um, so it gives, you know, again, uh, hiring managers kind of need to think through that and find where you know, where the talent are. Um, and Hannah, I'm curious on your side, Did you, have you seen like remote work go anywhere? Because I feel like we haven't, but I'm curious like what what, you're, what you've been saying. Yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of bad faith from companies not listening mm -hmm. to their workers who want remote work. Um, a lot of forced return to the office, a lot of lack of flexibility, um, which you know, I'm kind of rooting for this to backfire on them. <laughs> and we're, we're already seeing that, you know, research has come out that says that, you know, returning to the office is not increasing productivity. It's actually causing a lot of workers to leave and we're not surprised. So I, I see a lot of employees looking for remote work, but definitely less options. But, you know, this kind of leads me to the strength of what the salary guide provides from AQUIP because you can look up salaries defined by different regions. So, you know, maybe if you're in a different region than you want to be or you want to do remote work, you can also look at different regions and how they pay for different roles because you might find an area that is a better fit for what you want to live in. You know, like I live outside Washington, D.C., and it's a perfect fit city for me. I also love that there's high cost of living, which comes with high salaries. Um, I don't think that I would want to move to Idaho, for example. But, you know, if AI took off in Idaho, then I can look at the guide and see what roles are paying there. So I just think it's important to be aware of your options, whether that's in person or remote, and that salaries can vary wildly different based on different states. And so if you can't find yeah. remote work, maybe you can move to somewhere that you prefer that than where you currently are at and get paid more or less, but at least you're aware of it. Exactly. Exactly. And I think we were just talking about emerging, you know, roles, but there are emerging geographies too, right? So to be able to have kind of your hand on that pulse of like, wait a second, the cost of living is still kind of low here, but like we're starting to see the salaries kind of come up. Like, you know, there's a sweet spot there for folks to really kind of get in while, you know, obviously we had a big uh, migration here in Austin after COVID because, and that tech sector like blew up, right? But there was a sweet spot there of like finding out, okay, I can still tap into these higher salaries and still have a good, like moderate cost of living. Now, don't at yeah. me in the comments if you're in Austin, you're probably like, moderate costs. The past couple of years have been <laughs> wild. <laughs> I'm here, I'm yeah. with you. I, 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 I'm with you solidarity. I, I totally get it. Um, but I also want to touch on you, Hannah, you, you know, I couldn't agree more that return to office mandates have failed. That is definitely something that we have seen as, uh, as a trend. And those mandates have caused really people that leave their jobs, right? So, um, you know, some su suspected that it was a way of low key, like laying people off without laying people off, right? But the the data is clear. I recently saw an article that said uh, as little as six out of, I think 156 CEOs were just completely um, uh, no longer even trying to do a re return to office mandate, right? Okay. Um, 
and I think it's like, so yeah, so it's, it's trending in the right way. I think fully remote, it'll still, you know, there's going to be some, um, you know, plus, plus and minuses there, but at least some kind of hybrid um, is, is definitely there. Just having that flexibility, I think attracts great talent, right? Um, Ro, yeah. can you talk to that and anything that you're saying? Yeah. So, um, you know, the great return to office trend is not something that I'm a fan of. Um, Aquin is 100% remote and I've seen many, many, many benefits of us um, of us doing that. Um, and it's interesting. So in our salary guide, we do share that hybrid work has emerged as the most common work arrangement. Um, when you choose hybrid, you're essentially limiting your talent pool to the geographical locations that are within commuting distance, though. So that's something that definitely needs to be taken into consideration. And we also share um, in our salary guide that a recent global McKinsey survey of about 13,000 um, office workers found that more than 90% of employees need to live within commuting distance of the office based on on-site work requirements. So again, that has a major impact on your talent pool. So, you know, choosing if a role is 100% remote versus hybrid, um, impacts the talent pool, but also can potentially impact the cost too, as we're talking about the different, um, you know, city groups that we have and the different salaries for skill sets as we're, um, and, the, and those varies as well. So, you know, um, I think it's something that companies are going to have to think about. So the question companies need to ask themselves is, will mandating return to office policies deliver the results that they are looking for? Um, maybe not when it comes to available talent pool cost um, and interestingly enough, performance too. Um, so, you know, in we actually released a... Um, Talent Insights report. I think it was just a couple months ago, um, where we surveyed and uh, we surveyed a number of talent, and 66% of remote teams identify as high performing versus 47% of on-site teams. Um, and that's a big. I mean, that's a big swing there. So, you know, I think that we'll we'll also continue to see um, that on-site work requirements are going to be a sticking point for attracting top talent too. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious to know in the chats if um, if you all were offered two, you know, if you received two offers, one was 100% remote, one mm -hmm. was, let's say, hybrid three days a week, um, and the salaries were exactly the same. Which one would you choose? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. So if you want to chat in your answer to that, tell But in my experience, the talent are going to choose it all. All else being equal, the talent are going to choose the remote opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. So again. I'm not a huge fan of return to work mandates, um, and this these are all the things that you know I think companies need to consider um, while they're developing and implementing these types of policies. Oh, the chats are blowing up, bro. I'm oh. <laughs> <laughs> the chats are blowing up. Well, I want to touch on something because you mentioned our talent insights report, right, about high performing teams, and this kind of ties in because one of the um, key factors or key characteristics that we found in, in a high performing team is trust, right? So trust that someone is going to get the job done, going to do the work, doesn't need to be like micromanaged, right? To still produce results, whether it is in office or, um, or fully remote. So I, I, I'm glad that you brought up that up and, and we'll, we'll link to that, the talent insights reports as well on, on high performing teams. Um, so one thing I wanted to talk about too, when it comes to remote, right? I think obviously today's about salaries, but I want us to zoom out a little bit to, cause bro, you, you just like, you know, laid this up for me right now and really look at like total compensation, right? I think that's a big thing that also, you know, we've been centering uh, obviously a lot of our session just on salaries, but we know that it's more than just salary. It's, again, it's more total compensation. So uh, I'd love to, you know, I don't know, Hannah, if you want to talk a little bit about your your thoughts on total compensation and how, you know, talent should look at um, yeah. salary and then all the other things too. 
Yeah, total compensation is so underrated. I think a lot of people get hung up on base salary as the end all be all. If I don't make this, then I'm not working there. But the reality is, is that salary negotiation is a collaboration between you and the company. And depending on the size or structure or what have you that the company is going through, sometimes they might not be able to meet you at your exact rate that you want for base salary, but they can be flexible with other things to make total compensation more competitive. And I just remind everybody that everything is negotiable when you start working at a company like 401k match, PTO days, pet insurance, health insurance, you name it. If you have to spend money like commuting or using your, your computer to do work, that should be compensated back to you in the form of stipends or you know them giving you a laptop to do your work. Everything is negotiable and don't undercount the total, total compensation value instead of just looking at base. I love that. Absolutely. There's a lot to look at holistically. I know one of the things we were talking about in um, financial health is what is your employer match on 401k? Because that's like a lot of money. That's, you know, free money that you can really tap into. Future you will probably thank you. <laughs> you know, So yeah. this is just, just another example there. Um, Ro, I'm curious on your side, right? you know, uh, through the lens again of a hiring manager or business leader, what are some ways that they can, you know, incentivize, you know, you talked about resources, right? And how a lot of companies right now, they're kind of tightening their belts a little bit, but there's other levers outside of just base salary. Uh, talk to yeah. me a little bit about that, Ro, and what your advice is maybe for hiring managers. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think in addition to ensuring that the salary that you're offering is within market range, you know, that that is important to um, do your research there. Um, total compensation can really become your superpower to attracting top talent as a company. Um, and we're talking more than just the perks like serving craft beer in the break room or, you know, having pizza Fridays or things like that. Those things are fun. Those are awesome for culture. Continue to do them. But when we're talking about total compensation and what you can offer that actually um, is meaningful to folks. Um, it's really about creating medical benefits offerings, PTO policies, and other perks like education and retirement funds. And I love, um, Hannah, that you said pet insurance and you know also yeah. child care coverage, um, things that really support an employee's well-being inside and outside of work is really what's going to make the difference. Um, and you know, many of those things, um, you know, companies, the the expense of those things, the return that you get on them is so much greater too, and is worth the investment um, as an employer. Love that. I'm laughing at this comment here. So sorry, Rose said PTO is greater than pizza. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I agree with that too. <laughs> it reminds me of like when um, I, I'm sure Hannah, you, you get this a lot where people are like the employees like I want to raise, I want to raise, and then it's like, well, here's a pizza party. <laughs> yeah, we actually have merch. It's on the back of my sweater. It says anti pizza party. It's oh no way! Oh, that's amazing. Pizza party, like our pizza flies with like dollar pepperonis on it. <laughs> like, I need this. No pizza. <laughs> That is so funny. That does not pay the bills. That it's so cool. That's amazing. I need this. Awesome. Awesome. Sorry, that, uh, that just cracked me up. And I'm so glad you have that merch. I might have to look into that. Um, yeah. So I know we're, we're running in the last few minutes here, but I definitely want to touch into this subject, right? Because I think it's super important. And that is obviously pay transparency, Hannah. That That is, you know, obviously you're a champion for that, but also pay equity. So I want to touch a little bit about that because, um, again, this is a, a sneak peek on our salary guide, but uh, what we found is um, this last year, um, unfortunately, women, again, receive significantly less pay um, than men in roles of like des design director, which was minus 22%, creative director, almost minus 19%. Uh, and digital project manager, negative uh, 15%. Um, you know, so I, I'd love just to hear from each of you, you know, how have you seen pay equity or pay transparency, like impact your careers? I, I'd love just to hear, um, I know you mentioned Hannah, uh, like that's kind of what got you started, but I'd love just to, <laughs> to hear yeah. um, you know, more, more about that. 
Yeah, sure. So I'll touch on it pretty briefly, but um, I found out I was underpaid about $25,000 compared to peers in the same role in the same market. Um, and I forget if I mentioned this, it all kind of goes into a blur in my head, but I used to be a senior data analyst supporting government contracts in Washington, D.C., and I was making $90,000 a year as a senior data analyst supporting the contract, and I found out I was making about twenty dollars to $25,000 less than other senior data analysts in the area. And yeah, I mean, that was the ultimate form of disrespect. Uh, not only did I know I was bringing incredible value to the company and the contract, when I asked to be given, provided a raise, they told me two things. They said, one, I had to be at the company a year before I even qualified for a raise. And two, they didn't give out raises of more than three to 5% at any one time. So I was kind of in a pickle where I would either have to stick it out and you know try to make my market rate with three to 5% raises every year, which, you know, by the time I make my market rate, I'm already behind, you know, with the time it would take um, or I could go look for another job. And when I went to go look for another job, that was my light bulb moment for transparency, because in my first call with a recruiter, the recruiter asked me, you know, like, what are your salary requirements for the role? And I just had this moment where I was like, OK, I know my market range. You know, I know that I'm asking for 100 to 120 K. I knew that was how much, you know, my band was worth. In my mind, I was going to ask for 105 because I was at 90. So I was like, I can't ask for too much. You know, I can't jump too high. I'll ask for 105. But in that moment, I just had this second guessing. And I was like, I've done my my research, but I don't know how much money they have. I don't know what their cards are. So something wow. told me, you know, you have nothing to lose. Ask them what the budget is. So I was like, OK, let me just ask what the budget is. I have nothing to lose. And I give that recruiter so much credit because she really changed the game for me. Without hesitating, she told me the budget was about $115,000. And I told her immediately, I was like, perfect. That's exactly what I'm looking for. I was going to ask for $10,000 less until mm -hmm. she had said that. And it would have still been within my market rate. But imagine how long it would have taken me to make up that $10,000 difference over time. I would have always been behind, always if I had said what I thought I was worth. And so I think pay transparency is the ultimate way for companies to not only show good faith and demonstrate that they value and respect their workers, but in kind, workers are gonna go to places where transparency is reflected because it shows that good faith. We're tired of being underpaid, especially women. I've seen the greatest, you know, gap between workers yeah. of color and workers of different genders, workers with disabilities. There's so many pay gaps that exist. And a lot of it is, you know, categorical, like based on STEM and people going in, you know, women being in more women dominated fields and men being in male dominated fields. And I think that that needs to change in the times that we're in. We all have equal skills that can be used as strengths in different industries. We just have to work together to open those doors for each other. And that's where transparency really has strengths. When we share our salaries with one another, we allow others to know what the opportunities out there are that maybe they had no idea about. When I tell people I made 115 K and they're, you know, they have more experience than me and they're like, I'm at 75. How'd you do that? I didn't even know you could do that. Of course you didn't because we don't talk about it. But if we did, you could probably be making way more than me in your career. And I think that that's a tragedy. So we really need to work together to make these changes happen. Come on, say it for the people in the back. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Well, I think and it goes back to you can find how much your worth is with Aquin Salary Guy. <laughs> that's Bring what, it's back. like the, you know better, you do better, right? So that information, that transparency, it will help lead again to that equity. Ro, um, what about you? Any any um, stories or insight you want to share? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's this data is disappointing to see, no doubt. Um, mm -hmm. And I think although we've made gains in highlighting the real issue of gender wage gap in recent years, and we have heroes like Hannah out there who are spreading the importance of pay transparency, and um, I just you know, I agree. I think that this statistic shows that we still have a lot more work to do and we do need to work together to make some real change in this area. And, you know, if I'm speaking to um, companies, um, you know, actions that they can take too is that, you know, I think it's, it's, it's understood that, you know, a poor system is what got us here. So are you taking the steps internally at your company to change that system so this doesn't continue on in the future? Yeah. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And for the folks um, uh, on the live today, uh, we also have our, our check salary site. So um, I think we'll link that in the comments below. So you can always get real time data on there as well to help help inform you. Uh, but now we are getting into it. We're going to take some comments from the audience here. So please, if you have comments for Hannah or Ro, um, we'd love to um, answer in the um, last few minutes that we have here. And Felix, I just see yours. I, there will be a recording. Uh, so you can, I believe you can click on the link. <laughs> I'll just answer a couple on the um, thing here. How do we get a copy of the guide? We'll also provide that at the end here as well, a link to download the salary guide. Thanks, Shannon, for sharing the merch link. <laughs> Appreciate it. So. All right. Just scrolling through here. So if there's any questions, salaries, otherwise, I see something about whiskey. So I feel like I missed the, <laughs> I missed the party there. Yeah, oh, okay. Um, oh, oh, this is a good one from uh, Christopher. How do you approach talking with coworkers about pay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Talking about pay with your colleagues can be incredibly nerve wracking and very stressful. So give yourself grace. Number one, it's a very difficult conversation to have. But I say whenever you have a conversation about this, you have to lead with transparency. You can't ask others to share their own salary with you if you are not reciprocating that favor. So the best way to go is when you approach them, share your salary first and your experience. What is your, what are you struggling with? Don't beat around the bush. We all need to be transparent with each other in our situations, not just our pay. If we are, you know, just asking somebody how much they make without sharing the context as to why, why we need that information, it can definitely feel like you're just looking for information to gossip about. So lead with transparency, not just with your pay, but also I recommend having these conversations off company time and property. There are lots of employers that are not, really understanding that this is the shift that work is going in and that transparency is the future. And they are, there are some bad actors out there that can hold you accountable or, you know, get you in trouble for talking about your pay. So if you share your salary or you want to talk with your colleagues, make sure that you bring them out for lunch or coffee, you know, take them off company time and off company property so that when you have these conversations, Anyone, your manager can't be like, oh, well, technically it's your legal right, but you did it on company time during our hours. So we're going to get you in trouble for that. Just cover all your bases. Make sure that you're not going to get yourself in trouble. But understand that for most workers, it's your legal right protected under the National Labor Relations Act to share your salary. So if you are a protected worker, meaning you're not a government, railroad, farm or contractor, Every other worker usually is qualified under this. If you're not one of those, it is your legal right to talk about pay. If your employer asked you to sign an NDA, it is not valid. It will not hold up in court and they suck and you should probably work somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks. Anna. No, That's great info to have um, for folks. I'm sure a ton of people are asking about that. Um, let's see. I see a couple here. Uh, maybe, Ro, I don't know if you want to take this. How do I transition from digital design to UX design? I think we have, um, you know, probably a lot of, like, you know, folks in, like, UX and product and stuff on here, too. We do, yeah. So I think... Um... You know, there's a couple of different pathways where you can make that transition happen. Um, if you're currently um, working at a company in the capacity as a digital designer, um, raising your hand to take on additional projects or you know, communicating to your manager that you have a desire to um, go into UX design if there are any opportunities for exposure um, to those types of projects is a great way to start to gain those skills if you're um, currently employed somewhere. Um, if you are a job seeker looking to transition from digital design to UX design, um, there are a myriad of boot camps out there that are designed specifically to upskill you in that area. So I would look into those. Um, another thing that I would do as well is I would network with industry professionals and recruiters and ask, you know, ask people in the industry, um, did they make a transition into UX design? How did they do it? Or how would they recommend do, getting um, getting into UX design. Um, and then also recruiters can be a great 
mm -hmm. um, a great career counselor for you who they can talk to you about great ways to break into the industry, connections that you can make, groups that you can join that can help you in that transition as well. Awesome. Okay, one more question. How long should you stay at a job before you leave to pursue a better salary and upgrade your skills? I think this is a very relevant question. Who wants to take this one? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll just touch on it really okay. quick. There is no length that is determined that you should abide by. I had five jobs in two and a half years and I increased my salary from 40K to 115K. It worked very well in my favor. I did not trash my resume or my reputation by leaving for what was better for me. So if you see a better opportunity, you know, they owe you as little loyalty as you owe them. So do what's best for you. Love that. Ro, anything you want to add there? Couldn't have said it better. <laughs> great great awesome yeah. awesome i know we're, we're running up on time here any maybe we can end with any predictions for 2024 from either of you if companies are smart less forced return to office mandates and pay transparency love it here here yeah. We're here. <laughs> awesome. Yes. All right, I agree. So, you know how I feel about return to work. So, yep. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, we've touched on it. I, and again, for the business leaders on the call, like if you want the most robust, diverse talent pool, you know, if you can open it up to, you know, remote options, um, I think you're going to get a wide, wider pool. And I, I get there's, you know, constraints there. Um, oh, and I did want to say too, I actually wanted to share this stat. So Adam Grant, he's a, a world renowned professor at Wharton, right? He said mm -hmm. that people equated being able to work remotely as, as much as equivalent of 8% of their pay. Right. So think about that. If, you know, resources are tight, how that incentivizes you. How do you become an employer of choice uh, to to those talent? Right. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, Hannah, any plugs? I know you're all over the place. I'd love to give you the opportunity to, you know, share thank what you're doing you. next. Yeah, I'll just spew it really quick. Um, if you don't know our interviews, you can find them on Salary Transparency on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, anywhere you watch your content. And if you are interested in exploring our salary database or our merch or our free market research guide or free salary negotiation guide, all of that is on salarytransparency.com. And it was a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Uh, well, every time we got to make it now the third annual next year. It's just an so annual you know. thing. So every I'm year. putting that out there. And I yeah. just want to make a comment to in there. I saw paternity leave. Yes. Thank you very much. I appreciate no, no, that. No, no. Huge. Um, Ro, what about you? Any, any final thoughts for talent or for, you know, business leaders out there? I would just say really um, do your research, know the data, um, ask questions. Love, Love that. Bring it back to the basics, right? Yep. <laughs> Knowledge is awesome. power. <laughs> well, thank you everybody for joining. We will see you next time. Again, um, be on the lookout in the comments. If you haven't already, uh, feel free to follow our page on, on LinkedIn. Um, and then we'll have the resources for talent insights, check salary, salary guide. It'll all be there in the comments and we, we hope to see you next time. Bye. 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 Thank you.